I'm Tim, I'm the instructor type person here at the Old Sword Club. Um, you know, I teach in-person classes back before the plague hit and we we did in-person classes. Um, and now while we're on lockdown, I teach um, online classes. So yeah, that, that's what I do. <laughs> um, I'll, I will apologize in case there's like issues with quality um, or like just random kind of odd things about um, tonight's broadcast. I'm borrowing a laptop to do it because my normal desktop kind of carked it over the weekend. Um, so ho hopefully I'll be up with a new setup fairly soon that will be even better. Uh, but anyway, so tonight we're going to be talking about how to use a saber when you've got um, a scabbard in your offhand or alternate, and also how to use kicks in um, saber fighting. So that'll be kind of cool. Um, the manual we're working from is by a guy named um, Augustin Champon uh, or Chambon. Uh, he was a French or French soldier, uh, French author, um, who published a manual in 1911. So this is probably the most recent manual um, I've worked on. <laughs> I think uh, some of the most recent man say, manual I've broadcast about. Um, and yeah, he detailed basically what he thought was a good system of fencing uh, for soldiers, but um, with sort of the added benefit of having a, um, you know, of using your uh, scabbard as an offhand weapon as a way of sort of gaining advantage against your opponent, uh, not just in the context of someone attacking with a bayonet, although that was quite important to him, but also against cavalry and he even details how to deal with someone who's got just a saber. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so before we launch into it, I kind of want to just mention my background a little bit um, and just talk about where I'm coming from, where I do this. I just think this is kind of important um, that we be very, very clear about our own sort of biases and also our own, um, our own backgrounds when we do interpretation stuff, just because there's increasingly a lot of people who are being presented as experts who are not. <laughs> Um, so I should specify my background in Sabre is primarily in British Sabre, which I've been doing since 2006, or working on uh, primarily Alfred Hutton's work since 2006, um, whereas French, the French Sabre this is based on is a more, much more recent thing, so, um, and the two systems are different enough um, that there might be some confusion. I've been doing French Sabre, um, just like interpretation work on it, really since probably early last year. Um, the other thing as well is um, in some cases, and this is kind of relevant to the talk tonight because in some cases I'm working off what's intuitive or makes sense because Chambon writes like he assumes you um, you know French Sabre already or you're already familiar with Sabre um, enough to know what he's talking about when he uses the term, which, you know, like I've posted in the event things that are, um, manuals and stuff that I use to kind of fill in the gaps, but I think it's worth mentioning just in terms of being transparent about where my interpretation is coming from that um, as much as I've done my best to fill in my gaps with French Sabre, there might be some British in there. Uh, the other thing was with the cavalry stuff, um, like cavalry stuff, um, I rode a horse when I was a kid and that's about the extent of my experience with um, mounted combat. So a lot of this is based more off what makes sense to someone who's not, who's made, done a lot of fencing on foot. Um, and who has ridden horses uh, but hasn't actually done any fencing from horseback. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've played a lot of mountain blade if that <laughs> counts for anything. Um, so yeah, and I guess the point of all this is I'm happy to be challenged on any of this if you have any comments or questions um, or, you know, you want to make a response video and we can get some juicy YouTube drama going and, you know, generate a whole heap of likes, likes shares and subscribes for both of us. Um, yeah, don't like, don't feel like if you're a bit unsure about something, do just say because you know I'm presenting something that I'm working on because it's fun and we're all in lockdown and going stir crazy. This isn't me pretending to be some unquestionable expert. Um, anyway, let's start off. So, um, like I said, Champon basically assumes that you know a whole bunch about Saber because he just goes through. Um, at the start, or at the very least, he writes in a way that is requires other saber knowledge. Um, and in fact, I think it's probably it's not you couldn't necessarily say that he's writing because he assumes that you already know so much as he's 
could also be doing what a lot of 19th century authors seem to do, which is just assuming that by defining what he's talking about, um, you will understand it rather than, you know, like he's not actually writing instructions, he's writing definitions. Um, although even then his definitions can be a little vague, like very, or not vague, he's, he's specific enough, but he's very general. Like when he talks about cuts, he just mentions them. He says, oh yes, cuts, you do them, you do them all like this, you know, um, you do them all like this, and um, the best ones are, you know, cart and tears. But to start off with, let's look at how to hold the saber. So, um, Champon basically says you hold the saber in, um, in what is a fairly typical saber grip. You run your thumb up the back of the handle like this, and you use that to press it down into the, pad, the, the bottom pad of your index finger. From here, you take your index finger, and you use the top, like the tip of it, to push the handle sideways into the palm of your hand. Um, and this will secure the saber handle from all sides. You're basically getting downwards pressure from your thumb, upwards pressure, uh, upwards pressure, and, and lateral pressure from your index finger. You then use your um, root finger, middle finger, um, to do basically the same thing as the index finger is doing. Then you take your um, ring finger and little finger and just rest them gently on the handle. Um, these fingers don't actually tense until you cut. And I find that if you think about tensing your fingers as the first, mush as the first part of the motion of a cut, um, or as the, what gives you cut the impetus, you'll cut in the correct kind of, um, you know, extend first order quite well. Um, also, you know, using these fingers gives a quite quick snap to your cut, which is quite good. Um, all right, so now, that you, if you, now you've rooted form that grip, uh, what I want you to do is actually bounce the saber in your hand, like bounce it back and forth until it feels secure. And the reason for this is the way that I will grip the saber is not exactly the same as the way someone else will grip um, their saber because we have different size hands. And then if you're using a different size saber, there'll be small differences again. So, you know, there are no absolute and correct positions. Um, and the best thing to do is actually bounce it to see what feels the most secure using roughly, you know, a thumb on back grip um, because all things are approximate. So from here, now that we've talked about gripping, let's talk about the guard. And for that, we're going to need to get, well, this isn't a scabbard, this is a stick, but I don't have a scabbard for any of my swords because they're all fencing swords. Uh, so I'm gonna use a stick to represent the scabbard tonight, uh, but we're gonna talk about the guard. So to start off with, I want you to stand basically in a like, you know, attention position. Yeah. Stand tension. And I want you to take your scabbard side foot and rotate it around behind your sword side foot. So your feet are in an L like this. From here to come to the stance, we step so that we're about, our feet are about two foot widths apart. When I say foot widths, I mean the width of, or the length of your own foot. So if you've got one of, shoe, your, shoe, one of your shoes and laid it behind um, your front foot, the back of that shoe would be like, would be right between, you know, would be um, equal distances between each foot. From here, we sink down to a nice knee bend. We don't want to be too high because um, then we'll either bend our knees to move forward or step in a very pendular fashion. It'll be nice and low so that we can just fire ourselves forward and back um, as easily as possible. Now. For the scabbard, um, all we do is we rest with our, we rest um, our scabbard hand on our hip or close to, and we rest the scabbard across our body. So you can see the scabbard is actually pointing out wide of my body. It can be, the scabbard tip can be in line with the edge of your body, or it can be a bit wider. I found playing with this, it didn't make a huge difference, and I wasn't quite sure what um, where tampon wanted it exactly. So I'm like, oh, what what works best? And I couldn't. They all seem, both seem to work reasonably, honestly, reasonably similarly. For sword, this is where things get interesting. So what you want to do is basically start in a regular saber guard, so a regular kind of, you know, forearm vertical guard, um, arm at 90 degrees, hang down, and then you want to bend from the elbow until your hand is equal height with your shoulders. You've got this quite high guard. Your tip is pointed, point, is pointed quite high. Um, the... <laughs> Um, and people who've come to my other Sabre classes will, will immediately notice that I usually say not to do this because it does make the guard um, too biomechanically weak. Like any sort of pressure here will collapse the guard. And I have actually had, I've actually had this happen to me where I, um, when I was very new to Sabre, I parried like this and the person I was attacking completely blasted through my guard and hit me. Um, 
Champon doesn't actually disagree with this point. He says if a parry is held too close to the body, um, you you know it will collapse. So you need to extend out, and all the parries are normal sort of you know saber or normal you know normal length of extension for um, you know saber and also foil in the period. Uh, but the reason he does this is basically to keep the sword out of the way of um, the scabbard. So you know I can move my scabbard freely. Because uh, if I start in a normal like you know tear scarred, I'm going to hit my scabbard very very easily, um, and it's going to make doing a lot of the motions with the scabbard very difficult. Whereas if I hold it, my sword up here, my scabbard is free to move and to you know, defend me, um, to strike and whatever. Um, and the other advantage of this high guard is that anything that comes forward is going to come forward quite explosively. So I can actually because I'm so retracted. I can generate a lot of power and a lot of speed by coming forward. And that also means with parries, when I do go to a parry, um, even if my parry is a bit more committed, it's also a lot more percussive. So I can actually use that to displace um, an opponent's sword, which you know is kind of cool. Um, and we'll actually look at how these kind of explosive, extensive parries can be quite effective and can quite effectively move very quickly into a riposte as well. So I did try fencing from this guard um, over the weekend. Um, against Jacob, who may or may not be watching. Um, and yeah, what I found was as much as it's a little uncomfortable to hold and not very protective compared to a regular TS guard, it is um, the fact that it, everything explodes out so quickly um, kind of makes up for that. All right, so speaking of that, which let's look at actually how you meant to attack. So what Champon says is that you want your attacks to come out very, very vigorously um, and explosively. These are very direct, quick attacks. He says of cuts, um, you the best two are TS and cart. Um, so TS being this hand position with my hand at this angle in line with my, the sword side of my body, and cart, my hand is at this angle in line with the opposite, the non-sword side of my body, or the, the opposite side of my body to my sword side. And so what these cuts in effect look like is TS and cut. Now, of course, you can't just, you can cut an extension as a riposte, but in most situations, Champon describes you're going to need to get close to your opponent because he describes fencing against a bayonet or against someone on horseback. Um, so he wants, you know, so you are going to need to do this with footwork. So from here, the way you cut and the way I find most effective to cut in this system is I move my hand or I move my hand to the position that's going to cut from as I extend it. And then when it gets to almost but not quite full extension, I kick my front foot out and roll onto my toes, driving with my back foot. And my goal is to hit to reach full extension when my toes hit the ground. So this is a very, very, very explosive motion given how far back you start. And from here, obviously, I cut through because I have to cut through my target. I can't just tap it. And I quickly retract to guard as I pull back. So the motion from the front, just doing just a basic um, cut cut. So I extend, kick, lunge, retract. From the side, extend, kick, lunge, retract. You notice as I retract, I bring my sword up in an arc and then pull it back. I want to keep my tip out extended to basically threaten my opponent to make them unwilling to come in. Um, and the degree you do this in this system is a little different to what you would do in others, but you know, it's still there. You still want to keep a viable threat to keep your opponent at bay. So let's practice that with uh, the cart and tears cuts. So I'm going to so I'm going to call cart. I want you to move your hand to here, extend and lunge, and come back. So let's get you to follow along. So extend, in cart, kick, lunge, retract. Extend, in cart, kick, lunge, retract. Extend, kick, lunge, retract. Extend, kick, lunge, retract. Retract. And once more for luck. Extend, kick, lunge, retract. All right. 
So I'm going to call cart, and I want you to just do the whole motion in one smooth go. So um, still you like still do it in that order because you have to get your sword extended out to pose a threat to your opponent, and also to cover you on the way in. Um, otherwise, you'd be counter hit, which is something Champon does. Champon does talk about. Um, but I want you to try and do it in a smooth motion. So, cart, 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 and cart. All right. Now let's look at the other um, cut that Chambon re recommends, which is the t which is the tears cut. So my hand is already in tears position. All I need to do to cut from here is extend it. So not quite full extension. Tear it from the side. Extension, not quite full extension. Kick, lunge, and lunge, and then retract. So exact same sort of order, except instead of turning my hand over as I cut. I just extend it straight out. And this is where this retractor guard really kind of shines because this can be a quite difficult cut to generate power with when you're starting in a standard TS guard. Um, and when you're in a very, very extended guard, like you're not cutting on this line, you're going to have to move your sword to a different line to cut. Um, but from here, it's really quite percussive and powerful, which is kind of cool. So I'm just going to call TS and I want you to do the whole thing in one smooth motion. So Tears, 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 and tears. All right. The thing Chambon talks about is the Moulinet, or he talks about like, his saber injunction section is quite lengthy, but I'm, I'm kind of summarizing and condensing it into things that I can cover um, because otherwise I'd have to do, I really could probably do a whole, a whole month at least of workshops on this if I broke it up. Um, to, to the degree it's discussed in the manual. Um, but yeah, the other thing that he talks I want to raise now is Moulinets, which uh, in the British system is, tri is traditionally a wrist mobilization exercise um, and is very much an exercise that leads into a drill that leads into sparring, but is not part of, is not actually formally part of, or is not a technique used in combat. It's an it's a exercise. In French, um, Sabre, the Moulinet is most definitely used in combat, either as a way of generating power or as a way of moving through positions. Um, and what Chenbon says is basically you, can, you use Moulinets if you're outnumbered or if you're, if you're surrounded or you need space. You just start cutting Moulinets in front of you to drive your opponents off. So what you do from this guard is you extend out to, well, usually this, this kind of cart position, cut number one sort of position. Um, cut down, and then just draw an X with your tip in front of you. So this is the sort of Moulinet, this is kind of the Moulinet motions. Obviously, this is kind of a contraction of, um, you know, a series of Moulinets. So your basic Moulinet is you come to a position and you bring your sword in a complete circle. I extend position, bring my sword in a complete circle. Extend circle. I can do this on both sides. So extend, circle, extend, circle, extend, circle, and extend, circle. Now for Chambon, he recommends that you do both these Moulinets, like the inside and the outside Moulinet, um, in succession, you're basically cutting an X in front of you, because that's a way to basically draw your, or to drive your opponent off or keep him at bay. Um, which is, I find interesting because um, this is advice given by some of those, particularly Hutton, to do, if you have a saber and you're fighting against an epee, you just start cutting X's in front of them to keep them at bay and it works really, really well. So let's practice that. So extend out to this position, Moulinet, Moulinet down the outside, Moulinet back the original inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside. Let's keep doing that. This is a really good wrist mobilization exercise. Like there's a reason why a lot of systems actually recommend Moulinets as um, a start to class, but this is also a combative technique. Um, and something you can do as well if you're faced facing off against a medieval, an opponent who's using a withdrawn guard, like they're doing a medieval system or 
doing Velvil and they've adopted the guard of the High Hungarian. So you can actually just start cutting Moulinets at their hand. Um, and that will usually bring them out of the guard, force them to either throw in a cut to close the throw a center line cut to close the line so you don't just walk in on them and cut them, or basically get them to do something that will like do something that will cause them to um, to come out of their guard to actually fence you from an engaged position. So yeah, I, I can see where Chembon is coming from with this because it's something that I use and I think is quite nifty. All right, I'm just going to quickly check my notes. Um, if you have any questions, just chuck them down in chat, and I will get to them as soon as I can. Um, and yeah, um, obviously I won't get to them straight away, but I will answer them as best as soon as is reasonable. All right, so Chambon is very, very much a, he's very much a manual built around specific situations. And this is a very French approach to Sabre. Nearly all the French Sabre manuals, um, like the, each lesson describes a specific situation that you're in or a specific thing that you want to do. Uh, which I find quite interesting compared to say British Sabre, which is very, very general. Like British Sabre is, all right, these, you know, these are your basic cuts, these are your basic carries. Um, in many cases that they'll just tell you that and then throw you out defense. Um, in some cases you have manual, like you have manuals like Hutton's Cold Steel, which D or White, no Musgrave White, the detail what to do in, in more specific situations or more specific skills, like attacking the sword arm or fainting or fainting to bring an opponent out of a specific guard. But on the whole, um, British Sabre manuals are very general, whereas French Sabre manuals, on the, by comparison, are right. You want to, you know, you're attacking, defending the sword arm. You're throwing a direct attack to the body. You're throwing a Moulinade attack to the body. Like they deal with very specific instances. And what Chambon does is he deals with specific um, types of adversaries. He's specific in that way. The first of which is the opponent with the bayonet. Um, so I might. And this isn't unsurprising given that, you know, in a melee, if you had a sabre, um, and if you're on foot but had a sabre, so you're an officer or an unmounted cavalry, cavalry person, um, the most likely thing you're going to face is actually a bayonet. And this is something you see in a lot of late 19th century um, treatises where they, or like, man, you know, sabre manuals, is they basically assume you're fighting a bayonet fencer. With the, of the bayonet, which I'm representing here with my, uh, my padded spear, Timbon says that they can make two types of attack, or uh, well, there are two attacks to worry about. Um, because obviously in other bayonet manuals, they do describe things like tip slashes and butt strokes and striking with um, the middle of the bayonet. But what Chambon says is they'll either make a direct thrust, so extend, lunge, retract, or they'll make, do a throw point. So all I do here is I take my front hand off the weapon, turn my body as much as I can, um, and I just fling it forward. He says, basically the way you deal with these is the same because the weapon is coming on the same arc. The difference is how it gets, it gets there. So with a direct thrust, I'm, you know, it's slow, I guess slower. Uh, it's, yeah, it is slow. It is in effect slower, or at least it takes longer to reach its full extension. But it's a lot stronger and it's also a lot more recoverable. Which for because I must get with Bane or this at this point actually rifle with Bane that is quite heavy. They're quite committed weapons. A throw point by their hand is really quick. It has quite a long reach. Um, but you know, because I've only got one hand on the weapon, I don't have a lot of control. And because this move is quite ballistic, um, you know, if it gets knocked, if my weapon gets knocked aside. Um, I've basically, the only thing I can do to defend myself is use footwork as I recover. The, <laughs> but the advantage of this, of course, is that it's very quick, um, very quick and has a long reach and it's quite deceptive. And if you ever do bayonet fencing, uh, until people work out how to force engagement or your school just says, right, all fencing, bayonet fencing has to start from, you know, in, from tips crossed. Most people will do just throw a lot of throw points until people um, until people work out how to stop them, and we see this historically as well. So, what does Chambon say to do against a throw point and a thrust? 
Well, what he says is actually what you do depends on what the t um, on where they're going to hit you. Or what he says, no, what he says depends on um, your guard. So he says if you're in a normal high guard in tiers, uh, you know, like a high tiers, as your opponent comes in, regardless of what they come in with, you strike down with both bayonet and with both sword, saber and scabbard. And then once you've got control of their weapon, once you've knocked it down and knocked it to essentially this position, and essentially in front of you, you throw a cut, another cut. So we can, this is where you can see the Moulinet motion. So direct cut, Moulinet cut. Um, the reason he recommends two cuts is he thinks that cuts are nowhere near as powerful or as devastating as a thrust is. Um, and so he recommends you do two to the face. The other thing he says is that you need to keep your scabbard in position, basically still, to keep control of your opponent's weapon. Because if you can keep control of your opponent's weapon, there's not much they can do to stop you. So to show you that, all I'm doing with my saber is coming straight down. Um, with my scabbard, on the other hand, I'm drawing a little circle, I'm not moving across or down because there's a chance I'll scoop in under the weapon, under the incoming bayonet. What I do is I draw a little circle and strike down. So um, if my opponent, so I'm basically bringing my scabbard tip up and over, and then my scabbard gets to basically, or well, my tip of my scabbard gets into to basically in line with um, the sword edge of my body. That's what that's the trigger for me to then throw my sword down as well. So there is a timing element to it. So over and down, over and down. I'm just driving everything down, like I'm striking, I'm basically punching down with my sword and punching down with my bayonet, or even moulinating down with my bayonet to come to here. So to break that, so let's practice that move in a few times. So circle scabbard and sword down to guard, circle scabbard and sword down, and back to guard, circle scabbard, sword down, and back to guard, and circle scabbard, and sword down, and back to guard. All right, now let's try that with the follow-up. Um, so my, my opponent has come in, I've parried, now all I'm doing, I'll show you this from the side, so I'm flicking my sword up. So I turn my hand over. So my tip is out. My my there's now a nine degree angle between my blade and my arm. And then I aggressively bring my hand across my center line. So I'm here. Bring it to the other side of the center line as so I extend. And the fact that my arm goes from being nine degrees to full extended gives me enough of a whip to cut with my saber. And then just in case I come back around with a second cut. Let's practice that. So, parry, repost, repost, back to guard. Parry, repost, repost, and back to guard. Parry, repost, repost, and back to guard. And once more for luck, parry, repost, repost, and back to guard. So next thing Chambon says is what to do if your sword is low. Um, he says if you're in if you're in second, or what he says is a low tiers. He's a bit. He says they're both the same thing, which <laughs> they're not. Don't know how the manual describes them that way. Um, I think what he means is more that it doesn't really matter if it doesn't really matter what position you're in, um, or your position your sword is in. Um, you do basically the same thing, which I think is fair. But yeah, he um, a low TS would be here, whereas second is here. These are different positions. Uh, but let's imagine that we're in a low TS, so potentially we've beaten down or we're just we've started low. Our opponent has come, our opponent has attacked us high, and all we do is bring both sword, both weapons up. Um, so I'm in, and I'm in an extended version of the guard. So if this is my guard normally. The parry is extended here, and my sh my scabbard is brought out well in front of it. So my scabbard is with my arm in full extension. My whereas my sword arm is a bent a bit above ninety degrees. So here, 
and you want your, you do want your hand behind your skeleton to make this work, come up. So here, if you know you can have it below, up and straight up. And you notice that I'm arcing my arm, I'm basically moving my arm from the shoulder to whip it up. And then once it's clear, that's when I bring it around. So once more, raise, raise, and raise. This takes a little practice to get the coordination off. Let's do that a few more times, actually. I'll show you from the side. So I'm here, and I raise, or raise and punch. Raise and punch. Raise and punch, and raise and punch. And the reason why this is not, this is guard dependent rather than um, attack dependent. Like you can do this as attack to the, um, at an attack to um, the center chest, so Chambon reckons, is because in addition to, um, in addition to driving the thing, the weapon up, because my, so set this on something we can see. Actually, let's see if we can get this at a bit of an angle. That'll do. Because the bayonet comes in from, well, roughly this height, if it'll actually sit on the edge of my sword rack. Um, because the bayonet is coming in at this height, when I knock it up, I'm essentially shortening it. Like you notice, if I come to here, you notice how it's arcing away from me. So just having something in front of it and, call, and moving it with this angle um, is going to produce a parry. Um, and the idea is that because of the speed of, even though, because the bayonet is so committed, but can also be quite fast, you want to basically have one attack that, you, or one defense, one attack, one movement you can do to get control of it. Um, and this is actually something you see in anti-bayonet systems from the late 19th century. You know, things like Tui, authors like Tui, whose bayonet, whose manual is pretty definitely anti anti-bayonet saver manual. Guards like this, because it means my opponent is going to come in either over the top or under, but I go, I know where they're going to come in because of where they're engaged. So if their bayonet starts below my below my sword, I just parry there. If their bayonet starts above my sword, I parry here. And if they do, and if they try to retract it or to move it around, I attack them. So, you know, um, same idea with this. If my sword is low, I knock up. If my sword is high, I knock down. Um, I'm defend. I'm doing the same motion regardless of what the bayonet is doing, which keeps it very, very simple. It means I can do it very. I can do it very quickly, which is good for reflexes. So anyway, let's look at what you do. What you're meant to do for reposts from that position. So I start low. I raise. And then the first repost we're going to look at is I just come around with a cut. So from here, let's flick around. I usually remake contact with the saber or with the bayonet and strike. A quick question. Okay, that's good. Just comment. All right. So from here, raise and cut round. Raise and cut round. Raise and cut round, and raise, and cut round. So next repost we're going to look at is something a little different, something you don't see. I think is the only set manual I've seen this in, and that's using kicks. Um, what Tenbon reckons is that your opponent, this parry, if your opponent is committed, or if you're coming forward to do it aggressively, um, will bring you very close to your opponent. You can actually kick them, and you might do it for space. Uh, the other thing he says is you can also use a kick to stop them from coming in. So you know your opponent, what your opponent might do with uh, their bayonet is they might do a butt strike, they thrust, they get knocked high, so they reflexively come through with the butt of the weapon. Uh, this is something that you're going to see that is a lot more common in amongst uh, contemporary practitioners of these kinds of arts as opposed to people who did them back in the day. Uh, I suspect the reason for that is a lot of people who are doing bayonet now 
also do a lot of, uh, or they do a lot more swung weapons. So they do a lot more um, quarter staff and long sword and things like that. So their instinct in most situations is to try and swing. Whereas back in the day when everything was, um, or you know, everything was based on foil fencing, most people's reflexes was to thrust. So if they were caught, they'd probably try and retract um, just because of the, the other systems they were doing. So the kick is, you know, kicking to keep someone at bay is quite useful. Uh, the problem with Jambon is he doesn't tell us what type of kick to use. He just says you can use kicks and you probably can use different kicks from here. Um, the one I found the most useful is um, the oblique kick. Um, if you're a modern sort of kickboxer, mixed martial arts practitioner, I think it's uh, Chasse Bar in Savart. Um, I did link some video. I did link to two videos describing this in um, the Facebook event. So if you want to check those out, they'll give a better indication of how to do this than I will. But just as a quick summary, why I do this kick after I have come to here, my opponent is bearing in on me. So I raise my leg up like this and I kick out with my foot down, either at the knee, the hip, or even at the the joint, the hip joint here. So like the crease of the thigh. Um, the reason why I find this kick to work the best from this position is I find it forces me to lean back the least with, you know, like a front kind of push kick. Um, at the very least, I find I have a tendency to kind of lean back a bit. Um, I find it very hard to do the kick with any power whilst keeping my body upright, which, and if I start leaning back, I lose contact with the weapons or I lose control in the weapon fight, which I don't want. Whereas doing this, I can keep my torso relatively forward. So from our raised position, I raise and kick and come back. From this position, raise, kick, and come back. Raise, kick, and come back. Raise, kick, and come back. Raise, kick, come back. And raise, kick, and come back. Um, so the idea with this kick is more or less to stop your opponent coming in or to collapse their structure a bit. That's how it's certainly used in modern mixed martial arts. I mean, John Jones is really, really fond of this kick um, to the point where frustration, he nearly got it, not got it and kicks in his band. Um, but also like, um, you know, and he, the reason he uses it is a way to stop his opponent from approaching. Um, or if his opponent starts coming close, he does an oblique kick to basically stop them in their tracks and to control distance. And it works the same way here, um, except that when you're doing it with a combat boot, it's probably going to be a bit more damaging. Uh, certainly, with um, when you, particularly when you had combat boots that had a steel um, or like a steel plate over the heel, probably do a bit more damage. I'm not going to say how much. Um, I think the damage done by these kicks is routinely exaggerated as is. But yeah, you're going to, um, it's certainly enough to um, deform your foe structure and to basically give you a very, very big opening to attack. So that's how to defend and how to repost. In terms of how to attack, the attack is very, very easy. You just do the defense preemptively. So if I fight against someone with a bayonet and I'm here, um, I basically just come at them, strike down, and then cut and cut. If I'm here and my foe has a bayonet, strike up, or I just come at them striking up and get all choppy. Like the defense and the attack is pretty much the same. All right. uh, so we've got a few questions. So Bill wants to know, couldn't the scab be used to push the bayonet offline for the counter? It, it most certainly could. Um, you could you could displace it. I think the reason, um, the reason why Chen Bon is more inclined to keep control is more, um, has more to do with um, having a backhand foil fencing where in foil, when you've got a very light weapon, this is actually, 
an FA blade, but similar, if you can see. Being displaced sideways is very easy to recover from, whereas if you've got control of the weapon, you've got control of your opponent's weapon, it's harder for them to deal with. Um, and we do see a bit of, we do see some percussive movements, um, certainly in, with the say, certainly against Sabre. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely possible. Definitely, you could use the scabbard to push your opponent to the side. Um, I just find he seems dis, he seems to be quite happy with just having control of the weapon. But yes, you could certainly do that. Um, I just don't at this. Well, I might change my mind down the track, but right now I don't think that's what he's doing. Um, So and also, it could also be effective sliding down the shin and follow up a footstep. It certainly could. Um, in fact, in the in the um, saber section um, where you're a lot closer to your opponent, um, Jambon does say to do that. Does say to stamp to the shin and the foot, which is quite effective. And Ranjit, and we have Ranjit, uh, who's from India. Saying, so, well, nice to see Ray, Ray P, Saber appear movements. Love to see. Yep, no, it's good. I'm glad, you, glad you're enjoying them. Um, probably a little bit different to repair, but then again, who knows? I don't really do much repair, I'm afraid. All right, so let's move on and look at what you would do against cavalry. So the advice Jimbon gives against um, cavalry is... Pretty similar for both Lance and for Sabre. He spends a lot more time talking about Lance because he thinks that the Lancer is a much more significant threat. Basically thinks cavalry arm with a Sabre, um, you know, is essentially a less maneuverable kind of Sabre of saber and foot fencer, um, with the exception of the fact that he also acknowledges that the um, cavalry are usually coming at you at a gallop. So, you know, there's only really one chance for an exchange and you have to kind of counter hit them. Um, but the techniques he describes the same, the difference is the tactics. And um, unfortunately, because I'm only doing the one lesson on this tonight, I had to make a choice between discussing the techniques and the tactics. And I went with techniques because it's a bit difficult to implement the tactics without the techniques. So one of the things he says, um, if you're faced with an opponent on horseback, try and get to their left. So you're basically trying to force them to reach over their horse. So if I get a... If we imagine that I'm on horseback and that the front of this chair is my horse's head, I can't just come across because I whack my own horse in the head, which um, every horse I asked about this said they didn't like. Um, so I have to reach over and I have to turn, which gives me less reach and it's really awkward for me. Whereas attacking to my weapon side is really quick and easy. So what Chen Bon says is you're better off being on the um, you're much, much better off being on their left or being on their non-weapon side um, because that will give you a huge advantage um, in terms of how awkward it is for them to attack. Um, it also, from what I gather, would make the, make the parries more effective in terms of um, basically <laughs> disrupting the, the rider. But again, I, I have ridden, I can ride horses. I rid, rode horses as a child. Uh, I've never done any sword fighting from horseback or... I, the point of recording haven't. I really hope to change that at some point, but for now, you know, um, this is mostly me going what seems reasonable rather than, um, you know, necessarily direct experience. Um, although I have had a chance to bout with this against some with a sword, um, and I've done a bit of, done a lot of sword stuff, so yeah. got some grounds, I guess. All right. So what Chambon says is basically there are three ways to defend against the lance. Um, and what you do depends on the height the lancer is attacking at. Uh, so unlike the bayonet where he says, you know, it depends on where your guard is at, with um, cavalry, with, with a lance or with a sabre, um, it primarily depends on what, on um, where they're attacking you. And I find it kind of interesting that he basically assumes that the sabura is still going to thrust. They're going to treat their saber like a short lance, which is what Western European, um, Western European, and also North American cavalry units at the time were doing, and also Australian units to add some local flavour. So, if your opponent is if your opponent attacks you to 
which is attacking at chest height. What Chemon says to do is to parry cart with the scabbard. So I'm basically coming across my body and striking like that to what is essentially a cart position on the other side and to thrust with your sword, thrust with your saber. And the reason he says to come like this is if your opponent in if your opponent is coming at you on their weapon side, like you've, you're they've outmaneuvered you, this is quick and will knock this and will knock their weapon that way. Um, and you also need to remember that your opponent is not coming at you directly on. Horses generally don't like to run directly into people, um, and also you're, the rider is is wanting to minimise risk to the horse, so they're going to come at you from the side. So if you know if I was fighting a, a mounted opponent they'd be somewhere over here rather than directly in front of me. Conversely, if I do get to the, my opponent's left, doing this basically wrenches the, would, you know, would basically twist their body and wrench the, the weapon sideways, which would be quite uncomfortable for them. So it's you know, well worth doing to strike that way. But from here, all I do is I bring my tip around, tip my scabbard round, tilt level my body, and I punch it into a cart position. This is, you know, a lot, actually, a lot of champions' movements are quite ballistic, but that's the idea. Um, and I actually think, and the way I kind of interpret this is the movement of the movement of the tip will actually help generate power as I strike in. So from here, strike, strike, strike. Really, cart parry, cart parry, cart parry and cut parry. All right, and what Chenbon says about the riposte is that you just want to extend out straight with a thrust. Um, and primary, the advantage of doing it like this is that the momentum of the horse galloping at you or galloping near you will cause the rider to ride onto your tip. Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously you want to put some power behind it, but you're basically expecting the opponent, to, a lot of the force to come from the opponent's movement. Uh, what's interesting is he says that you can strike your you can strike a mounted opponent either in essentially the stomach or um, stomach, or you can actually thrust the horse as well. And he expects that the combine the momentum of the horse coming towards you with your thrust will be enough to penetrate the horse um, and will be enough to do quite a bit of damage to it. Um, we're going to practice assuming you're going at the rider, just because in a modern HEMA context, um, horses are notorious for not acknowledging hits. So you don't need to go for the rider because they're, you know, a bit more honest. <laughs> not, not to impugn the honour of horses, but still. So what we do is as we strike, we bring our tip down and then we extend. So it's strike and extend. Oh, cart and extend. Cart and extend. Cart and extend. Cart and extend. Extend. Cart and extend. Cart and extend. And the timing is going to vary, probably more to your coordination than anything else. Um, I personally I find simultaneous movements on either side quite difficult. You know, in after six months of practice, I probably won't. But yeah, the timing is going to vary a little. But the idea is basically that as your tip comes online, you want to push. As you as you bring your the tip of your scabbard online, you also want to bring the tip of your saber online, and you will push them both out, either scabbard then sword, or both at the same time. Right. So. If your opponent, on the other hand, rather than aiming for your center of mass, for your center chest, is instead trying to hit you in the head, what Chambon says is to parry with, um, with parry with a high cut, with a high tears, with um, the scabbard. So this is high tears on the sword side. This is high tears on the scabbard side. So from here, what I do is I beat the scabbard. I beat my opponent upwards. And because my head is small enough, is a small enough target, the fact that I'm a set, um, it doesn't really matter what side I need to go to. Unlike the cart thrust, which is basically going to shorten the, the attack and protect me, um, you know, I don't have to worry about it being swept across my body. With this, I can just knock it up and it's going to miss me. 
And the other thing is because it's being knocked high, I don't have to worry about the lance basically crashing into me or like doing a lance swipe, which John Bond said is things that lances will do, but he also thinks they're not really that dangerous. So he's he's not terribly worried about them. Right, so all we do is we come to high tiers, the scabbard. Open side, high tiers, scabbard. High tiers, the scabbard. And you notice this is where this high guard really comes in handy. I'm not intersecting with my sword, whereas if I had my sword in a more um, extended normal guard, I'd have to move it before I can get my scabbard up there. So high tiers with the scabbard. High tiers with the scabbard. High tiers with the scabbard. Right. Let's quickly check. I've got a comment. Um, so Bill wants to know, couldn't you use the cross step with the left foot to get more power into the parry and use the length of the saber to counter? Or is this the strong side approach only? Um, you certainly could. Uh, I don't see, like, you certainly could use a cross step. You certainly could use a lot of different steps. The thing is, Chambon doesn't. Um, I think it's something, with a lot of these systems, you kind of have to view them within their own context. The idea of, um, pass, like, passing steps are very, very rare in 19th century fencing, and in this case, like, early 20th century. So as much as you certainly, there's a lot of footwork you could do, in terms of just doing a passing step or, you know, like a traverse kind of thing. Um, certainly would work, um, especially to give power and to get a better angle. Chambon doesn't do it. Um, and I suspect the primary reason for that is because it's just not common within the systems that is just not common within um, fencing systems of the period. All right, so let's look at what you then meant to do for the repost. So I'm here, come to a high, high tiers. And one of the things that's very important, I'll get low, give you a bit of preview of the next one. You notice that the tip of my scabbard passes by this blade of my saber. And when it does, that's what lets me drop my saber down and counter thrust. So what I do, parry, and then counter thrust. The thrust movement is I drop my tip down to bring it online and then extend. I don't want to bring my tip online in flight because what will happen is I'll basically turn, I'll basically get something that's half cut, half thrust, and not really good enough to be either. You know, sort of the um, you know the the um, the averaging of a cut and a thrust produces a fairly ineffectual attack. So what I want to do is parry, descend, and then thrust. Parry, descend, 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 thrust. And what I find with this, it actually helps to move from the shoulder rather than extending out um, because I find that because you're not really worried about opposition, you can start from much further back. And this has a really, really lovely explosive quality that this doesn't. Um, and, you know, if you're already generating as much power as you can, you might as well, you know, in for a penny, in for a, a more power to your thrust. I know, I know I was going with that. Don't, don't think about that. Right. right, so we have a question. Uh, is this different from competition moves where the scab is not in the left hand? Uh, please explain, sir. Yep. Um, by the standards of the period, it's not as different as modern competition fencing. Uh, it's, a, it's certainly closer to 19th century fencing where the um, where you know you're using more similar weight saber, um, but yeah, it is it is a bit different. Um, the main difference is because you've got this retracted guard, everything is a lot more um, percussive. I can fire this out really really far and fast, whereas in a normal kind of tier guard, 
I've still got a good extension. I still get a fair amount of power and speed. We'll certainly have to do damage, but it's not quite as much. It's not certainly not as, um, when I say percussive, I mean a normal cut will extend, make contact, and maybe displace a little bit, not a lot. Whereas with these, um, because I'm really able to fire it out, will hit a lot harder. Um, so yeah, it is it is different. It's a, it is actually probably different to a lot of the, the fencing you see in the period. Um, you know, and certainly very different to competitive fencing or, or the competitive fencing that was around. There's something Champon actually talks about where he says that uh, if you fence in, if you fence in the cell, you will be a better fencer, except that terrain um, terrain will be a problem, and also there'll be a lot of things thrown at you that you're just not used to. Whereas if you learn his system, um, you'll be able, you know, you'll have learned the techniques that are most useful when you're, in, you know, when you're fighting um, outside of the cell and when you're able to deploy, um, able to deploy kicks or use a scabbard in the offhand. Uh, also, in terms of what's common, just to be clear, because I know this is something that kind of get that does throw people a bit. Um, the use of the scabbard in the offhand is very rare. Uh, in fact, Chambon is the only manual we have describing it that I know of, um, and manuals from this period are very, very common. So, you know, Chambon is really, he's quite, very much an outlier. It's what he's doing is not typical at all. Like this is, um, you know, kind of almost obscure fencing that just managed to get recorded. Um, but yeah, the uh, and then the only use there are there has been there are descriptions of you of the scabbard being used as a weapon, usually when a person has um, either lost or is not using their sword, uh, but not yeah, but never um, the offhand never in the offhand. It's always um, as a single handed weapon, and dual wielding systems are very very rare in this period, like exceedingly so. All right, so Chambon has one more piece of advice where in terms of dealing with cavalry. Um, and I think this is also probably, of the things he describes, is probably the most useful against um, cuts. If you've got an opponent who's coming in, coming at you with a cut, other than his regular advice of just, you know, just parry it like you would normal cut, normally parry a cut, um, using some, some normal fencing that he doesn't really describe in great detail. What he says you can do is if you don't want to have to decide between defend, doing a chest parry um, and doing a head parry, is you can um, you, know, you can split the difference and squat down as your opponent comes in. So from here, what I do, is I raise my sword, scabbard up, I drop to my knee. Um, I'm doing it a bit more slowly because I don't want to hurt my knee on the floor. Um, and then you counter thrust, and this thrust is explicitly at the horse. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to hit the rider, or if you are, you're only going to hit the leg. So from here, I drop and raise and counter thrust. I drop and raise, counter thrust. So same motion as before, except I'm squatting down as I do it. Drop and raise and counter thrust. Drop and raise and counter thrust. And once more for luck, because this is really quite tiring. <laughs> I really need to work on my fitness. And drop and raise and counter thrust. All right, so that's kind of the three main techniques, and every other bit of advice Champon gives is tactical advice. You know, um, and he does say that you can use parry, that you can parry and repost um, against cavalry, but he doesn't go into a lot of detail. Um, one thing I will say, based on what he describes later, um, the parry repost is much, you know, much quicker because he's punching to the parry position and then continuing that mentality that momentum into the repost. So it is quick enough to hit um, you know, a mounted opponent as they ride past. Right. Cool, Bill said. Almost like a pasta soto. Um, yeah, yeah, it really is like a, a drop lunge. All right, so let's look at what Chambon says to do if you're facing an opponent with a saber. And one thing I find very, very interesting about this, he never describes um, he never describes what to do against someone who's using a scabbard in their offhand. He just says, if your opponent comes at you with a saber 
and the depictions even show just a you know his training partner with just a saber no scabbard um here are things you can do so he never actually describes how the system works against itself which i think is super cool um the reason being is that um this is a historical this is a really interesting historical development like the idea of a system that is purely asymmetric is something that only really seems to appear in the 19th century like in most medieval systems um they seem to they all seem to start from an assumption of um the opponent has the same weapon as you like it's weapon on weapon fighting it's essentially you know like sparring or like a dual you know dual of equal weapons and then there is additional advice when you have asymmetry. So what to do with a long sword if your opponent has a spear, what to do, what to, how to use your dagger if your opponent has a long sword, that kind of thing. Um, like it's additional stuff and is very circumstantial. But there is, you know, but the core assumption is symmetry, um, which I guess also goes with sort of the medieval and Renaissance mindset that is very, very, um, or is much more about is much more about finding likeness or finding patterns. This is very pattern seeking. Whereas when you get to modernity, you get the French Revolution, um, and actually, really, once you get to the Enlightenment, there's a bigger emphasis on definition, on giving everything, on rigidly defining everything. Um, and what this gives rise to in sword fighting is a tendency to see sword fighting in terms of its application. So, you know, the you know, when William Tui wrote a system that really just seems like to be a here's what you do if your opponent has a bayonet and you have a saber or you have a cutlass um system no one really bats an eyelid because you know like to the point where it's not really even discussed very much because it, it probably seemed obvious to a lot of people that definitionally you would be fen you know you would be fencing against a bayonet if you had um with your sword rather than fencing against someone with equal weapon um and Chambon's much the same. He doesn't actually talk about how the system fights itself. He only talks about how it fights things that are typical in the period. Um, so against someone with a bayonet, the most typical, against mountain opponents, either with a lance or with a saber. He spends a lot more time talking about the lance because he considers it the more dangerous weapon. Um, and then he talks about what to do if you're, you come up against someone who has a saber themselves. But I'd say because he, no one else has thought of using the scabbard as an offhand weapon until now, he doesn't see any need to explain it because definitionally it's not something that would happen. It's a hypothetical. Although this manual is written in 1911, so how much sword fighting of any kind there was um, is, you know, debatable. Um, um, also on top of that, and you can also see a similar echo to this in cavalry manuals at the time, which basic, which primarily assume that you're going to be um, chasing fleeing infantry and coming out of fleeing infantry. They're not, they don't, they focus a lot less on cavalry on cavalry engagements, um, as opposed to earlier manuals, which focus on, okay, you're fighting on horseback against, you know, someone else with the same weapon, um, which, yeah, I just find really cool. So what does Chambon say about opponents with a saber? Well, the first thing he says is that if you face someone who's done a lot of fencing in the cells so or in the fencing hall, they're, you know, they're going to be better trained than you most likely. He says, you will learn better use of the saber in uh, the fencing hall than you will in army drill, um, probably because army drills, the drills that you're doing are a lot shorter, you can't spend as much time on it. And there's also, um, and also probably because you're sparring, which I suspect is something, he doesn't say that, but I, that's what I suspect he kind of is alluding to, or at least that's where he's drawing this observation from. He says, however, there are exceptions that make what he's doing very, like what he's describing very necessary and will give someone trained in his method, which is meant to be a military method, the advantage, um, and that's that fencing the cell does not prepare you for fencing in terrain. Uh, interesting enough, what he means by that is he actually talks about proximity. He reckons that engagements are a lot, start a lot closer, like you're fencing, like the way he talks about it, it sounds like you'd be fencing inside buildings or, you know, in you know, or like in melees where you're going to start really close to your opponent, whereas in the cell you can, you know, start the opposite side of a piece to move in. Um, I found it very curious when he actually describes the effect of terrain. He always describes it in terms of proximity rather than in terms of footing. Um, compared to uh, Jules Jacob writing a few decades earlier, who says that the fact that you fight saber duels on, usually fight them on grass rather than in a wooden hall, means that you can't lunge as much, and that's what and um, Jules Jacob, when he talks about the difference between cell fencing and dueling, or you know, 
you know, I guess life and death fencing, he thinks the surface you're on is what makes the difference, whereas Champon thinks it's the proximity, it's the fact that terrain presses you in, um, you know, which I find quite interesting, especially um, thinking about the conversations I've had recently with people who do sports fencing um, and, like, when they're talking about, you know, how bizarre they found it to, you know, do a little bit of fencing on grass um, or, you know, just, like, you know, occasionally fence on a non-fencing hall surface with a friend. Um, the other thing he says is that fencing um, or learning his essentially expressly military fencing um, also means that you can throw things at a person who's done fencing in the cell that they have no training or idea how to deal with. Uh, he says kicks, he says punch. you can punch them in the stomach, you can smack them with your shell, you can kick them, um, but particularly he says you can use the scabbard as a weapon. Um, and to his mind, this gives you quite a considerable advantage. So just grabbing my notes so that I don't get too lost, and too rambly, too off topic. Um, he gives some basic some basic tactical advice. What I find really interesting about it is it's actually quite similar to Jules Jacob. He says, you know, primarily you want to go for the hand, the opponent's hand. You only want to go for the body if you have a big opening. Um, although he has additional ways to create openings, whereas when Jules Jacob is describing saber dueling, he says, you know, you can you you can use beats with the saber, but you're better off waiting for a repost or um, you're better off using a repost, like parrying and returning. Um, I'm very fond of Jules Jacob because he basically he basically tells me to fence the way I was already fencing, so I just had I had a historical source that gave me an excuse, um, which I thought was quite helpful. Um, but yeah, um, it's kind of interesting that even though Chambon is talking about what is happening on a battlefield environment, where Jules Jacob is talking about what happens in a dueling environment, their advice is pretty similar. Um, and based on my experience of doing essentially just a lot of sparring with blunt swords in the cell, when I'm against when I was against opponents who are um, otherwise much more skilled and experienced than me, and I had to bring my A game, or just you know when I wanted to do the things that were had the best you know, had the lowest risk for a still fairly decent reward, I do the same sorts of things. So these are techniques that are really good in a lot of different contexts. Um, although, you know, there are some differences based on like, you know, differences in guard and stuff. Anyway, the first thing that Chambon says to do is to attack the wrist. Um, because you're starting a lot closer in a battlefield environment, the terrain is forcing you in. Um, I actually do wonder very much if he, I do suspect he even, um, he actually expects that you'll be using this primarily in buildings, although this is more inference on my part. But what he says is attack the opponent's sword arm. So remembering that a typical fence will come on guard um, like this in a medium or a tierce guard, or if they're French, maybe even a cart guard, because you do see this you do see this a bit in uh, French saber in the period. Um, you know, if they're doing you know a foreign system, they might use a hanging guard, but that's something Champon really discusses, most fencing was done from basically this height, or saber fencing is done from basically this height in this period. Um, alternatively, it might be with an extended arm. Um, if you're doing, you know, some styles of French counterpoint did this. I think the there's a lot of Italian systems who still had these more extended guards, um, although I'm not sure when they went to the retracted guard. But either way, what Champon recommends works, because I'm starting from up here, all you do is bring your is you bring your sword online and you stab down onto their arm. So I bring my tip online or I start, realistically, I start moving it so that it comes online. I want to minimize the amount of amount of time I have to bring my tip online in flight. I bring my tip down and thrust and stab my opponent in the arm. And sometimes to get the angle, I have to arc it a little. And sometimes I can bring it directly, sometimes I'll be able to bring it directly online and thrust. But you're basically thrusting around the guard. What makes this safe, the reason why, you know, you don't do this with just a saber because you'll get counter cut, is I've got the scabbard. So as I do this, I extend my scabbard a little, I basically want to touch it to either my to my hilt or worse, my hand. So that way if my opponent tries to counter cut or counter thrust me, there's a scabbard in the way. So let's go bang, hit, thrust and hit, thrust and hit, thrust and hit. Thrust and hit, and thrust and hit. I imagine this would have been very, very confusing for some poor 
19th century Sabura, who has used to single weapon fighting and has not encountered um, the use of a powering object for, I mean, basically, um, the use of an offhand powering device had fallen out of favor in Europe for hundreds of years at this point. And even before then, um, you know, during sort of the early modern period, fencing was still primarily single weapon fencing that you occasionally added a defensive object like a buckler or a powering dagger to. So this is some, so the idea of having an offhand object to protect, to allow you to thrust, do a thrust would normally be very, very easy to counter cut. Probably quite difficult for a lot of, um, a lot of Saburas to, to deal with. So just check my notes. There's a question I'll quickly answer one doing that. Uh, so, uh, so we've got a question uh, from where can I, uh, can I see the tampon manual? Uh, it's in the description. So it'll be, if you're on YouTube, it'll be in the video description. If you're on Facebook, it will be in the event description um, and also in the discussion. So you can find it in both places. All right. So the next thing that um, Tempon describes that is quite effective, um, again, that's quite effective against Saber, is beating the Saber out of the way with the scabbard. So from here, what I do is I strike with my scabbard. And there is um, a bit of a trick to it in terms of power generation. You want to be able to bounce your stick in your hand or bounce your scabbard in your hand. And you want that looseness. Um, you want to have that looseness. You want to be able to basically let the tip drift back. So I extend, you know, I'll show you from the other side. I let the tip drift back as I'm coming forward, or at the very least my tip stays basically stationary as my hand comes forward. So that it's coming out forward at sort of this kind of angle. It's almost like I'm almost letting it retract in flight and then I fire it out. Um, and the motion of the arm is a very whippy punch. So think um, if, you know, you've ever whipped someone with a towel and, um, you know, locker room shenanigans or whatever, um, you know, muck around, basically similar motion to that. If you think about like, if you imagine you're whipping someone with a towel or cracking a whip, the idea is the hand movement of this is basically a combination of that, of the motion you whip and a punch. Um, and it's this very loose, very quick, you know, whip kind of action. And that's what generates your power for percussion's purposes. And also you could use this for striking. Um, on Champon never actually, I don't think he ever actually says that you can. I think, no, I think he says you can. He never actually describes the, the techniques in detail, but you most certainly could use this kind of beat for striking. So all I do is extend out and hit. And when I strike my opponent's saber away, I follow up with a, I follow up with a cut. So I hit, cut, 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 hit, cut. And I can actually let my weapon drop. Um, let my scabbard drive back because I'm not using it to control like I am against the bayonet or against the lance. I'm using it to strike. And if I've still got contact with my opponent's sword after strike, the beat was not effective. The other thing as well is I'm bringing my sword across my body or my hand to be in line with the opposite edge of my body. So my sword is in front of me um, and this will cover me as I come in. So I'm essentially, coming forward with my sword in the way. So that if my opponent does bring their sword online quickly and counter thrusts, or in case the beat misses, I'm just throwing a normal covered cut with my sword that's still effective. Um, you know, what the beat essentially does in this context is it creates enough space that when I throw a cut with opposition, my cut with opposition um, you know, is not, doesn't have contact with my opponent's weapon anymore mean that my, it's going to be a lot harder for my opponent to parry. Whereas if I just, you know, if we're here and I just throw this cut, you know, come in, 
because I'm going to, I'm basically striking my opponent's blade with um, my shell and normal cut, I'm covered. You know, you can see this from my sword is in front of me, essentially parrying forward into my opponent aggressively when I throw a normal cut. And I do the same thing when I beat and cut because I do want to cover myself in case my opponent comes back. So yeah, that's sort of the, uh, the beat and cut. The next thing Champon says you can do quite, you can do that's quite important is counter thrust. And he says specifically counter thrust um, because you will get opponents who will rush in at you. They will come, um, you know, come barreling in. Um, or you might get opponents who, being used to much greater space, will throw a big wide cut expecting that they have the distance to protect themselves. Um, something you do see in sort of continental 19th century systems is they'll withdraw, you know, they'll pull their sword back, or they'll withdraw, you know, they'll do like a, you know, or do a Moulinet, or, you know, if you're Tui and worthy of a lot of the criticism that he got from some, um, contemporary saber sources, you just pull back to the shoulder and chop. One of the things about Tui is he, it is very, when I say it's a, an anti bayonet system, there's no way you would cut like this against a saber because you get counter cut, um, unless you had a really long lunge. And this is actually a thing. A lot of these systems that retract and come in have are done on a very, very long lunge. Um, I actually had a, a fenced person who did, I was one of the Italian systems. Um, if you're more familiar with Italian saber, do let me know. Um, and would do these sorts of things where he would you know, retract and come in. And I'd see it and my brain would go, you can counter thrust that. And the one time I did actually counter thrust, I, my, I didn't stop myself by going, wait, you're not in anywhere near distance. And counter thrust, my opponent just came. He just didn't lunge as far and whack me on the arm instead of coming at my head. Um, which, yeah, it was bad. But if he tried to do that in a confined space, like say we're in a building um, or on a battlefield where there's a lot of people around, and, we and you know the point where we're actually fighting is we're starting at you know just lunging, and, you know just out of lunge, just out of extension distance. Those kinds of priming blows are not helpful because they leave you very open to a counter cut, to a counter thrust. And the way that you do this is you kick it, you kick your back foot out. Uh, you can do this quite pendulously, bring your tip forward and thrust and then come back. And the reason I'm kicking my back or I'm lengthening my back foot like this so you, and counterweighting a little bit is it brings me forward. So I actually get a little bit of extra reach. I'm not just extending. I'm counterweighting to basically poke my opponent before they're in range of me. Because if they get into range of me to hit, there's a much, much bigger chance they'll actually get me. Whereas if I can hit them before they reach that point, um, I'm safer. And the other thing this lets me do, because I've brought my foot out, is I can pull myself away and retract to get out of danger. So I'm basically poking my opponent when they, um, when they say raise or prime their sword, and then retreating just in case I don't drop them instantly. So motion is extending counterweight, retract. 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 Um, and once more for luck. Extending counterweight, retract. Um, I think as Bill was saying before, it's relatively similar to um, it's Posada Soto, um, which I hope I'm saying that right. Um, of all the, well, actually, I'm probably more ignorant of um, Central European, like German and Scandinavian saber methods, but I also know that I don't know, but at the very least, I know that I don't know very much about Italian. Um, but in uh, one thing that Hutton says that he says is an Italian technique is you can counter thrust by doing this, which he refers to as, I believe, Prasada Soto. The idea is I just drop down and come into my opponent. And motion is with this, I'm not going near as far, but the idea of counterweighting and coming back is common to both. All right. Tea. 
right, cool. We've got another question before I keep going. Ah. So Bill said that's what he's referring to as Posada Soto. Cool. So I got it right. Excellent. I'm glad. All right. So the next thing that Champon says you can do, Champon, I keep calling Champon. It's Bon, B O. Um, is you parry, you can parry a post, um, but unlike say normal saber that I've kind of mostly skipped over to be honest, um, when you're fighting from this guard, a parry a post becomes a bit more ballistic. It actually behaves differently. So to get a sense of how it's different, if I'm doing my normal kind of sabery thing, I'm doing my normal British stuff, you know, my parry is the thing I just kind of move to, and just come to my parry position and then repost. And it's a fairly calm motion most of the time. You know, from my medium guard, pop up to a nice tears parry, pop to a cart parry, you know, come to head parry, sub team, really whatever. But it's a very calm motion that relies on the strength of my structure for defense. And the advantage of this is I'm not very committed. I just move to this position, and if my opponent's finding me, I just move to the other position. I'm just making these short, smooth movements. Chimbon, on the other, on the other hand, um, because he's starting from here, which if he just takes the blow with the, his arm that's retracted, it's going to collapse, like his parry will collapse, um, he instead has to punch to the position. This means that the parry is more committed, like once you choose a direction, you, you know, you're, um, once you... Once you make the parry, you, ba you, know, you basically have to make sure you're, you know where your opponent's coming, so it is a bit more vulnerable to being fainted. But the advantage is it's a lot more ballistic. You know, if I start in this TS guard, something comes in at my right shoulder, and I parry it, that thing is not only going to stop, it's going to get displaced. Which is cool, because that gives me a big opening. Worse still for my opponent, I'm already moving forward and it's fairly easy for me to maintain momentum and just change the direction of my hand. So I don't just parry and repost like I would in a normal system. I parry and repost quite quickly. It's bang, very, very quick movement. Um, and I learned when I was sparring Jacob with this, this it worked quite beautifully, which was, which was really cool. Um, I'll get I'll get back to your question in just a moment, but I'll think, when I finish this. Um, so the motion for this is I start my guard, I punch to a TS guard, a TS parry position. So oh, it's the other way. Um, TS parry is this, or you know this. My arm is at ninety degrees. It's the height is very the height is um, varies a bit, but my arm is always more than 90 degrees because if my arm is less than 90 degrees, my opponent will blast through it. If I need to change the height, I move up and down from the shoulder. Um, and if you want to you want to see this in action, just um, any of my introductory saber or um, introductory cutlass fencing lessons go into a lot more detail on this. But we're just going to use a standard medium tears for this. Then for the medium tears, move my hand over and I punch out. My goal is to do this in a smooth motion. So start here, tears parry, um, cut, cut, and back to guard. High guard, tears parry, cut, cut, back to guard. 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 Let's try and do that a little smoother. So I'm just going to call parry repost. Or I'm just going to call repost, actually. It's one word. It's easier. And I want you to try and do that in a smooth movement. And as long as you can do it smoothly, I want you to see, I want you to get progressively faster until you can do it in one quick smooth movement. So guard, and repost, 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 repost. If you find you miss a step, slow it down a little. So I think just there I kind of 
went straight into the cut. And so I need to slow it down a little bit. And yeah, you're gonna need to do the same. Like this is a thing that you practice. You need to practice a bit to really get the hang of, but it's pretty freaking sweet if you can do it. And repost, 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 and repost. Right. So the technique is the technique when it comes to card is relatively similar. I from this retracted guard, punch to cart, and then repost with well basically what most termed a TS cut. So punch to cart, repost. Punch to cart, repost. Punch to cart, repost. Punch to cart. Repost. Punch to card. Repost. Punch to card. Repost. All right. And now let's try and do it as a single smooth movement. So. And repost. 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 Repost and repost. Cool. So I just, all right, so I'm just going to quickly check for other questions. Right. So, saber, rapier, lancing swords are consistent of straight cuts, uh, but from around the circuit cuts, do you prefer a cut or something else? Uh, so the way you cut with uh, so way you cut with a saber and a cutlass is basically the same, uh, and same for a single stick. Um, and the idea is basically I will punch my hand out an extension, and my tip moves in a circle. So I punch and whip basically, punch and whip. Um, I don't want to arc my hand, so you know I don't want to do this with my hand. My hand does this motion, it's punching out quite directly, and it's only my tip of my sword that's moving in an arc. Um, this is, um, these are what were termed um, direct cuts. Richard Burton says there are three types of cuts. Um, he says there are direct cuts, which uh, he reckons are not very good, uh, but are very common in British fencing. The latter being true, the former being no, they're, they're pretty good if you know how to do them properly. Second are whipping cuts. So whipping cuts are where you basically do a Mornay or a movement with, um, you move your sword in a circle to hit, uh, like a bigger circle to hit rather than a direct small circle, um, which Burton prefers. Whipping cuts tend to um, work a lot better from an extended guard, whereas um, direct attacks work, or direct cuts work better from a retracted guard. You can't do them from an extended guard. Burton incidentally favors an extended guard, which is why he likes whipping cuts. The other one he says um, are full body cuts. And so the idea is that instead of using my arm, my arm and my lunge to generate power, I use, um, you know, I use the arcing of my hips and the muscles of my back. Um, and what Burton says is this is very, very common in, in, um, in India and also in the Middle East but not very common in Europe. Um, although, just, from what I gather, it's probably more similar to um, what many, you know, probably something that medieval or some medieval systems, or quite a few medieval systems did. But the idea is, I, I mean, I can leave, you know, when I do them, I can leave my arm fully extended and just cut with my hips. Whereas the cuts that you're doing in um, 19th century British sabre, extend my arm, and my tip moves in a small arc. Extend my arm, tip moves in a small arc. Um, so I hope that answers your question. All right. So in terms of things you can also do to take, you know, to defend yourself in saber, you can cross your sword and scabbard. Um, and very, very important, don't just put them in an X, because uh, if your opponent can put pressure here, um, they can actually trap your swords against you. You need to make sure that when you do this, you're still pairing with either the scabbard 
or the sword, and then you're using the other weapon um, as a, uh, for, to displace or to bind. So from here, if I want to protect my sword side, extend my scabbard and bring my sword down to punch it to a parry position. I'm still parrying with the sword, and then I'm displacing and hitting with the scabbard. So from here, parrying with the sword, displacing the scabbard and hitting with the sword. Parrying with the sword, displace with the scabbard, hit with the sword. Parrying with the sword, displace with the scabbard, hit with the sword. Parrying with the sword, displace with the scabbard, hit with the sword. And parrying with the sword, displace with the scabbard, hit with the sword. On the other, and I can do this on the other side as well, on essentially my scabbard side, except in this case I'm parrying with the scabbard, um, I'm parrying with the scabbard, and then displace with the scabbard and hit with the sword. So my scabbard is what actually stops it, uh, is what stops, the, you know, my scabbard is essentially what is actually powering the blow, and the sword is just here to stop, you know, to make sure it doesn't go too far or become too deceptive. So, parry with the scabbard, displace and hit with the sword. Parry with the scabbard, displace and hit with the sword. Parry with the scabbard, displace and hit with the sword. Parry with the scabbard, displace and hit with the sword. Parry with the scabbard, displace and hit with the sword. Um, so obviously the question and probably arise. I know what your questions are, but my suspicion, but you know, in case there, why would you why would you not just parry with the scabbard? The reason is to protect your hand. So scabbards in this period of metal, if a sword hits them. Um, it will very easily, it could very easily bounce off and slide down. And sabers were intent, sabers were intended to be very sharp. Uh, like the rule, the military regulations were that you were meant to sharpen them to, um, you know, to be razor sharp. Whether soldiers did or not is a not, is a matter of debate, but not something you want to risk because a sword coming down the line of a metal scabbard is going to take your fingers off. So from here. I want my I want my sword blade in the way as a way of stopping the thing from riding down. Um, so I can then I can then get that displacement, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to quickly check what the um, check what the questions are. All right, cool, nothing major. All right, cool. Uh, the problem with this, I mean, this kind of parry is quite good. It means that you can get, you've got a big powering surface or a big area you can use to get control of your opponent's weapon and then displace it to somewhere. Um, and you can even, um, you know, and you can even use this to parry on one side and then move your opponent's sword to the other before I'm crossing. Uh, it does have one slight weakness, namely that if your opponent catches you here, they can actually choke you up. If, and the angle is very, very subtle and specific. And to be honest, it's quite difficult to show without actually having a partner. But there is a solution. There is a solution that your opponent, there is a solution that as someone who has only learnt defense in the cell will never, um, will not be able to deal with. Um, and that is kicking them. So the idea is. Um, and you can even do this deliberately. You can even do this as a deliberate tactic. I parry with a cross and kick. I even recommend, if you're going to do this deliberately, I actually recommend do it with a step in and kick. Um, and as Bill said before, the kick is very, very good for stamping. And this is something that Chambon says in the section that you should target the knee or even scrape down the shin of your opponent. Um, which was, well, well that, was, that was something that was coming into vogue in um, 
combatives in probably that period was um, scraping your opponent's shin with um, the edge of your boot. Um, and you see it in some World War One combatives, and certainly in World War Two combatives, it becomes quite popular um, with anyone who trained with Fairburn. So, step forward and parry, and kick. 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 And just once more, because I'm getting kind of tired. Step forward and parry, and kick. And back to guard. All right. So that's um, basically Chambon and how to fight dirty with a saber, or you know, how to include kicks, um, uh, kicking, and also the use of a scabbard. Um, so just answer a few questions. Um, cool. So uh, we've got, so from your from your point of view, which sword style is best in continents? Um, so technically. Um, in terms of continental systems, I like French counterpoint. Um, the, I like it. I particularly like Vaville. Um, I just most of what I like about it is the way it's laid out. Like the lessons uh, make very are very coherent. You know, he starts with well, they tend to start with the most common scenarios, the most common things you need to deal with, and then go through. Um, and then go through um, each, and then go sort of through by, you know, how the scenarios are. So it means that after each lesson, you've got someone who is fairly competent in dealing with specific situations, um, as opposed to, I think, other sword systems which tend to be more general. But I find actually, of what I've been exposed to of continental systems, they tend to be both very general and very complex, um, which means that it takes you a long time to get good with them. Whereas, uh, you know, French counterpoint, okay, it's still quite complex and to be well-rounded, it takes a while, but after every lesson you, after every lesson, you will be reasonably competent at dealing with a specific thing. Um, so, you know, after the first lesson of Verville, if someone attacks your sword arm, you've got a reasonable chance of knowing how to defend yourself and um, riposte. Or if you want to take some sword arm, you've got to read, you know, you're fairly, you're fairly competent at doing it. Um, I kind of assume by incontinence you meant like on continental Europe. Um, so, I mean, my favorite system is probably um, Alfred Hutton. So what Hutton describes in Cold Steel and the Swordsman. Um, but also like, and, but also I, I like British stuff. Um, I find Hutton, you know, I find Hutton is quite a good manual because his actual instructions are quite simple and straightforward if you're a kinesthetic learner. If you're a visual auditory learner, not so much, but I am a kinesthetic learner, so that keeps me happy. Um, and then, you know, weight is more complicated, probably a lot better for visual learners, to be honest, given that he, he uses a lot more visual cues. Um, but, you know, just it's still a good manual. Um, Allenson Wynn is really good because he gives a basic instruction introduction to the two most common British methods at the time, that is um, the Angelo method of 1845, which you see basically in use um, right up until around World War One, or you see being taught up until around World War One um, in various ways. And then also William Toohey's method from uh, 1868, which was adopted first by the Navy and then by the Army. And you see floating around the place um, probably up until I think the most recent I saw, saw a manual describing it that wasn't a military manual where it just kind of hung around was um, 955. That's true. Although I have seen naval footage from even from the 30s, I believe, as like black and white footage of um, troops on a ship, like British naval, um, British sailors um, practicing um, to his method. Um, but yeah, if you want, in terms of my favorites, and again, these are things that suit me. Um, I like Hutton, I like Velville, 
um, yeah. Um, other than that, I don't know a lot about other systems. What like, I mean, most of the reason I don't talk much about Italian is I don't know very much about it. I've done a few seminars. Um, I know very little about German, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Um, I've seen bits and pieces of uh, Spanish uh, Spanish systems, and they seem cool. Um, but yeah, don't again can't really comment. Um, and yeah, just that's kind of where you know. It's, um, those are those are my preferences. So yeah, if you're looking for a good manual, uh, Alfred Hutton's Cold Steel is probably a, is a re really good place to start. Or um, actually, I think Alfred Hutton's The Swordsman is better because it's the same method as Cold as um, Cold Steel, but he also has a section on foil. So when he uses a term or he references something in foil fencing, you can just go back a chapter to look rather than needing to look up a foil manual. Um, and he's a bit more concise, which is nice as well. Um, also, there's more pictures, which is well, it's actually, there's the same a number of pictures, but he's got pictures where the diagram shows different positions on the one diagram, which is really nifty. Um, and then, yeah, and then uh, Verville is not a great beginner's method. It's because there's whole, there's whole chunks of things he just doesn't describe. Like he just says, like he describes things entirely using terminology and you just kind of have to put it together yourself. But his actual method is pretty good. Um, Bill said Sidwell's Paradox as a defense is a good one also. Um, yeah, it's, I did silver for years. It's decent. Um, I find it's my only criticisms of it really is that it's not as universal as silver thinks. Um, in that it's you know it's very much a long range system built off um, a very positional game, um, as opposed to which as opposed to a universal system like so a universally applicable system like silver seems to think it is. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's good. It's a good long range. It is a good long range system. It's very principles based, which is nice. Uh, it's very versatile, which is nice. It's got like a lot of variation um, in technique, which is cool. Um, also, he explicitly, there's a bunch of things he says very explicitly that uh, later methods would expect you to learn through bouting, um, which can be really, really good, it, particularly if you're starting out and you don't have a lot of bouting experience, like you haven't done um another way like another weapon combat system um cool so while we're here are there any are there any further questions come sort of um now that i'm sort of i'm answering questions we've moved into q a time um should probably i should probably just divulge into um historical anecdotes to give you a chance to ask your questions or at the very least drink some tea so I'm a bit parched. That's, that's really interesting. Um, cool. All right, so I'm gonna come in just asking because I'm practicing samurai systems and Indian sword systems, so English swords are always fascinating. I have two sabers and two straight swords with me. So I follow your YouTube, oh, your YouTube set. Oh, awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed enough to follow it. Um, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. For me. Yeah, no, it's really good. It's um, certainly, I think, like, I mean, looking at different systems is really, really cool. And, um, and especially sort of Indian systems, because I don't know very much about them. Um, if you want, I mean, and it's sort of, I kind of relied on people knowing a little bit about Sabre tonight, just because there was so much content. I couldn't really cover both basics and specific content. But if um, you did feel a bit lost, check out um, my solo cutlass workshops and my Sa there's a Sabre crash course, or even just watch all of my Sabre videos, because that will break things down in a lot more detail. Um, but yeah, if you want to just even just comment on what you think, um, like what you think um, the differences or similarities are, that'd be really, really interesting. Because um, yeah, I think, um, I don't know, I just, It'd be very interesting to compare like European and um, Indian systems just because the cultures um, you know, were ultimately, well, um, you know, very, very different. The systems are different, but there's also a lot of cross pollination. Um, I saw a really quite wonderful um, YouTube video um, by the channel Odd Compass about uh, firearms manufacturer in medieval India. And they talk, was talking about how. Um, because India hadn't domestically developed um, a lot of firearms technology, they just imported Portuguese. They just used the wealth of India. Well, India was incredibly wealthy at the time to 
import a bunch of Portuguese gunsmiths, and there was this huge amount of sort of cross pollinization um, even from even back then. So it'd be very interesting to see. Um, cool. So uh, one other thing I will mention um, just now is that it's in fact my it is in fact my birthday. Um, oh, and the chat has just collapsed, has just crashed on me. Um, Oh, well, that, this is not something that's happened before. I, uh, I don't know if you can see the chat stuff here, but um, my the chat has actually crashed on me at my end, so hopefully things aren't going badly where you all are. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, it is actually my birthday tomorrow in kind of a weird way. So um, yeah, normally at this time of um, the lesson, I'd ask for you to make a donation just to keep the club, you know, keep the club um, continuing on. I mean, obviously I'm going to do my best to keep doing this stuff as long as I can and I want to keep and certainly whilst we're in lockdown I want to keep everything free like the online lessons but we do have some small overheads um, you know we obviously have to pay for the streaming pay for the streaming service we need to pay web hosting uh, that kind of deal also we need to start putting money aside for when we start back up physical lessons so if you can contribute any money you contribute is going to go towards running at the club um, which is really really cool um, but also would be really, really greatly appreciated. Um, and like I was saying, it is, it is my actual birthday tomorrow. Uh, the other thing is we will be, um, from here, we are gonna be meeting up on Zoom. Um, so I know I can't actually see the chat right now. So if you did have other questions, um, if you did have any other questions, um, please just join us on Zoom. The details will be in the video description if you're on YouTube or the event description if you're on Facebook. And you can ask the questions then. Um, and yeah, otherwise, uh, next week we're coming back with more kind of, I guess, HEMA oddities or like, you know, kind of odd, oddish weapons <laughs> um, systems. This time it's going to be cutlass um, and pistol, and specifically um, using the pistol as a powering device, according to uh, one William Pringle Green. So hopefully I will see you there. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like us on Facebook. Uh, if you're watching a recording of this, leave a comment. Um, and yeah, um, maybe even make a donation if you maybe even make a donation. So anyway, and I will hopefully see you all next.